Welcome to Strata. I'm Glenn. And I'm Brandon. Welcome to the Minds on Muscle podcast. Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Minds on Muscle podcast, your podcast for fitness professionals. My name is Brandon and I'm here with Glenn. Glenn, how are you doing today? I'm having a great day so far, Brandon. How are you doing? I'm doing really, really good. We got some exciting stuff coming up. We got some new audio gear. Actually, if you're watching the video, we got some microphones coming. We're missing one piece, but we're really excited to up the level of the audio for you to give you a better product. Because just like we talk about in all of our programs for Fitness Pro Mentors, how you do one thing is how you do everything. And we're all about quality because we want you to experience the product that we love to share with people. Today we're excited about talking about something I'm really excited about. Glenn, what are we talking about today? Opening up your own personal training business, Brandon. I'm very excited for this topic as well. I think this is one of those topics that even if you've had your own business for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, you can never have too much information about the basics. Foundations, foundations, foundations. And today we're gonna to talk about all the foundational stuff that you ought to know and think about if you're gonna open up your own personal training or fitness professional business. So one of the things I love about this topic and I love through the mentorship program is that we have superstar personal trainers and business owners come through our program all the time. And all these things we're gonna talk about today are things that have really escaped some of these really high-end professionals, small things. Small things that once you define them, you go, oh my gosh, I didn't even think of that. And once you know them, it makes it so much easier to create marketing content. If you think about our clients, we do this amazing thing where a client comes in, we figure out who they are, we collect assessment data on them, and then we design exercise for them if you're a science trainer, as, uh, as I've been told we are. Right With our business, we don't often do that. We go, I, I like this, I like this, I like this, and here's the product I wanna create and people should give me money for it. It doesn't work. In reality, if we know these pillars that we're gonna start off with right now, you can reverse engineer your business, your marketing, your communication, your product, your exercise machine selection, and create something that's really, really stout, which I love. I love the concept of reverse engineering. We talk about that a lot in the fitness, <clears throat> excuse me, the fitness pro mentors group. Knowing where you wanna go and then working backwards is one of the best ways to grow your business. And as Brandon just touched upon a second ago, this idea of making things client-centric, like what does the client want? And before you can really dive into what the client wants, you have to know what is one of our first pillars here, the client avatar. Brandon, what's the client avatar? Well, if you think of it this way, when you're designing your product, and this is something that I've done, and I know Glenn has done, and many people in our biomechanic -y world has made this mistake, is we become superstars at with a scalpel, and we tell everyone with this scalpel that we can work with any person, no matter your age, no matter your problem. We are super skilled at cutting right through and designing exercise for anyone. But in reality, if you market to everyone, you'll get no one. And so what you have to do is you have to become an expert. You have to become someone who's super focused on a very specific niche. So I love saying the idea of client avatar. Know your client avatar, just like you're playing Mario Kart and you pick Luigi or Mario, right? If you think of Luigi, Luigi has very, very specific visual characteristics. He wears specific colored clothing. He's got a specific shaped nose. He makes specific noises. And once you know Luigi, it becomes so much easier to predict what Luigi's gonna do when he's playing the game. So when we know these client avatars, like one of the ones I love to use is Pat 65, right? This person who's over the age of 65 and Pat 65 here at Strata is this affluent individual who's retired. They're a professional. They have a university level degree and they don't give up without a fight. There's someone who struggle with pains, aches, and problems in their body. And what do they do? They try to solve those problems by all the means you've heard of. Massage, physio, Cairo. They're brilliant. But the problem is these people have tried all those things. They've been solved. Those problems have been solved a little but not entirely. And so that's where we come in. Since these people are active seekers, they are constantly trying to solve their problems, we come in and we design a customized exercise strategy that appeases their intellectual capacity, their actual pain points, and helps them get more out of life. When you know this client avatar, your messaging, your marketing becomes easier. And what ends up happening is you can actually charge more and become more laser focused in your community. Because if you've got this Pat 65, and you focus on marketing to them, you become just like an attorney, like a criminal lawyer or some other specialty where everyone goes, oh, I'm over the age of 65 with a pain. There's a personal training studio that works with that. That's for me. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to only work with these people and that you're gonna turn away other kinds of clients. Brandon and I both have a client avatar that we work with, but I have clients that are not that avatar 
at all. I mean, most of the people that I market to are very similar to Pat 65, but a lot of my clients, a handful of them are 25 to 30 year old uh, entrepreneurs or uh, young professionals who want to be in really great shape and they appreciate the knowledge that I have in getting them to that area or getting to them towards their goal. So what we're not saying is that you're going to turn away people and only work with these kind of people, but if you're for everyone, you're for no one. You can think about it like casting a net. If your net is to try to get all the fishes, it's going to be a pretty big net. There's going to be a lot of holes between all the rope. A whole bunch of those fishes are going to escape through. You're not going to catch very much. However, if you have a smaller net or a very specific client avatar and you cast that into the ocean, you go to the right spot where your clients are going to be, right? The fish that you want to catch, you can get a whole bunch of them and you're going to have a very flourishing business. It doesn't take a lot of clients to earn a lot of money. And you get 20 great clients in your schedule, you're laughing. I like using restaurants as an analogy for this because it's a very easy one. If you go to Kelsey's, which in Canada is kind of like this generic, a little bit of everything bar style, style restaurant, and you go in there and you order a steak. Steak's probably $25 because steak's expensive, and it's a fine steak. If you wanted beef and you wanted it sort of medium rare, you'll get it. But if you really want a steak, you'll go to the keg, or you'll go to Ruth's Chris, or you'll go to one of these steak houses that are experts at creating steaks. And you're going to pay double the price for a steak at the keg relative to Kelsey's. But when you go to the keg, you know that the experience, the care, the precision, and how it's going to taste, it's going to be awesome and exactly what you want every single time. When you go to Kelsey's or any of these other restaurants and you order a steak, like when I go to a breakfast joint and I get the steak and eggs, if you've ever done that, you know the steak you're getting is ain't no steak. It's a piece of beef they call steak. It's not the same. But you go to the keg, you know what you're getting. And the nice thing about the keg is even if you're not a steak person and you bring someone to the keg and they order something that's not a steak, because of how well they do steaks, you know that the rest of the products that they create are going to be high quality as well. So you bring your vegetarian friend, they get a vegetarian dish, it's still going to be great. And so that's what we need to think of ourselves as personal trainers, is we want to be a specialty. We want to be a culinary chef in one special niche. And then, like Glenn's saying, you're going to get people who are not of the steak eater kind. But because you're so good in one direction, they're going to see the value that you bring, which allows you to charge over three figures for an hour of your time. It's absolutely the best way to go about it. The last thing I will say before we head on to other pillars, because we've got a lot of pillars when it comes to going your PT business. There's a lot of them and we, gotta, you know, we want to cram it all in today is you can't be specific enough. A lot of the people that I work with in the Fitness Pro Mentors program, they don't want to dive deep enough into their client avatar. For different reasons, it's not necessarily important, but getting as specific as you can with your client avatar is really gonna allow you to tap into how you market to these people and how you end up getting them into your schedule. It's really important, and a good friend of mine who has multiple successful six-figure businesses told me, be as specific as you possibly can. And another friend of ours, uh, Dr. Welpton, who is a chiropractor in town, I mean, she does a great job of marketing to women over a specific age with back pain. That's extremely narrow, because she's given herself an age demographic, uh, a, a gender demographic, and a specific pain. So people who have knee problems who are younger are going to see that and go, well, they don't work with me. But wait. She's an expert at working with this one thing. So I love that. So number two, Glenn, what is number two? Number two is building of your community, your tribes, your tribes, Brandon. I love Seth Godin's book, Tribes. Amazing book. If you have not listened to it and or read it, it's great. But one thing that is more powerful than really anything, and this book eludes that, is that the community you build within your facility, your client base, the people that you talk to of this niche, bringing them all together and having the camaraderie of multiple people together is insanely powerful. And it's one of those things that you see the negative impact all the time within politics and sports teams where there's two sports teams competing for the Stanley Cup or something and one loses and they riot, right? One person would never create such a massive riot but when you get that team together of such strong values of the Toronto Maple Leafs or whatever it is, they will do something incredibly negative. But at the same time, others will do things incredibly positive. What we wanna do is we wanna make sure that of your client avatar, you're bringing them together because other people like me go to places like this. And if you can bring them all together, it creates this incredible, powerful referral network. So it's not just them. They're not alone on this journey. There are people who echo the same pain points. And that means if you can get more of these people communicating and 
which we're going to talk about in another section here in a second, which is actually the fourth one, not next. If you can actually share a lot of value to these people and continue to show them that you are a resource for all of them, that can really supersede any sort of look at me style marketing. And I think that a lot of people have in their minds that they need to have an extremely large following on social media in order to fill up their schedule. And it's not really the case. You, you could do brilliant and have a full schedule with a thousand dedicated followers. On your social media platform. Well, less. A I would hundred. even say less. Yeah, and I mean a perfect example. And I don't want to. And I don't mean to deter, derail you here, but okay. with the fitness pro mentor stuff, I mean for me, I, I have a successful business where Glenn and I are working with people one on one and in a group setting. And I start off with 450 followers, and as this has grown, I'm getting more and more. But the business is rolling. And we're helping people and we're seeing some amazing changes with even smaller amounts. So you're 100% correct. You don't need a lot. No. And I mean, listen, at the end of the day, community is what's going to help your business grow. People talk to other people. If you've been in the industry for a while, you know that warm, uh, excuse me, warm leads and warm referrals from people that you already know are one of the best ways to get new clients in your schedule. And that only really happens by having a strong community of people. The, the, you know, again, you don't need a lot, but you get a nice tight community of people that are like-minded. They're going to spread the word for you and referrals are going to come into the door left, right, and center. One of the things that I did in the past, and I didn't have to do with Strata before COVID because things were kind of rolling, but I've resurrected, is this idea of building an online community. Because when you have a one-on-one -on -one relationship between Glenn and his clients, those two people together create a small union, and they're a business and an entity on their own. On the gym floor, even if I'm out there with a client, we're in the same space, and we're interacting, and it builds the culture, but... We're not all on the same team at that moment. But if you create an online community, the nice thing about the online community, like a Facebook group or Mighty Networks or something like that, is it can supersede the brick and mortar. Why is that important? Well, two reasons. One, COVID. If you can't see people, you can keep people in your world and you can keep them communicated and connected. In Canada, we're going on 14 months of intermittent lockdowns. Crazy. We've got a lot of people who have not been in in that period of time who are still in our community, which is incredibly powerful. Second, and don't do this, Glenn, here. But if you're in a facility and you actually want to move and open up your own facility, have your clients come with you, right? This is a great way to keep people connected, to move on to the next step. He signed a contract. No. So <laughs> Can't get out of it. So if, if you're doing this and you're trying to grow and move on, you want to open your own space, one of the greatest ways to prepare people for the opening and then announce other events like live trainings and webinars and workshops and whatnot is an online community because they're already connected. And so, and this is how you'll start seeing things interweave with each other. You have to know your client avatar. And knowing your client avatar is actually going to also tell you where these people hang out, even online. Now, when you look at the demographics of Facebook, it is more people who are older, over the age of 30, over the age of 40. They tend to hang out more on Facebook. They're on Instagram too, don't get me wrong, but they're more on Facebook. If the target demographic that you have is going to be people who are 50 plus and you're doing all your time on Instagram, that's probably not where your tribe is. It's probably not the best place to build your community. However, if your market is going to be young 25 to 30 somethings who want to build a lot of muscle, then maybe Instagram is going to be the perfect place for you to go. Again, knowing your client avatar is going to really show you where you ought to start building your community and how to interact and connect with these people. Once you know your avatar and once you build your community, marketing is one of the things that everyone I talk to seems to struggle with. And I say this to Glenn all the time, and I, there's just so much marketing information that's out there that I find that people have a hard time implementing. And part of it, there's self-confidence with how do I get this information out there? I don't want to be putting myself out there in this way or which information is the best to share. And so if you're ever struggling with how do you get your message out there in your marketing, my favorite is point number three, use social proof. Social proof is so important because we as professionals can say all we want, how great and amazing we are, but it just sounds like boasting. Most of the time, if it's just you, however, if people who are like your client avatar are interacting with you and they're telling their friends how amazing you are or they're writing you testimonials, it shows that it's not just you who's saying that you're great, but other people are saying you're great too. And those are the kind of messages and the kind of connections that the people that you want to work with are looking to see before they say, yes, you're the person I want to work with. 
if you think of like a celebrity cameo, it's a perfect example of the most extreme social proof, right? If Robert Downey Jr. popped up on Minds on Muscle podcast, hundreds of thousands of people would flood into our podcast. Cool. But they're here for Robert Downey Jr. Not so cool for our business. Now, if I have clients who are like other clients in my community, over the age of 65, shoulder pain, back pain, things that are influencing their quality of life, and they can on video or through a photo or through a text message, tell part of their story that other people like them can relate to, that is a perfect, amazing celebrity, local celebrity cameo with someone like me that goes to places like this that have problems like me. And it makes it so much more relatable and so much easier to have a lower cost entry and not have to worry about being caught or in some sort of funny sales strategy. And there are easy ways, especially if you're a new trainer, that you can start getting social proof. And I think a lot of new trainers struggle because, well, I haven't worked with anyone just yet. How am I supposed to get the social proof? It can be very simple in engaging with your friends and your family, asking them if they have any questions about health and fitness, and then answering them, and then getting their feedback. And they send that feedback, like, yeah, that piece of advice was great. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Snap that, save that image, whether it's on your phone or your computer, whatever that is, and you've got social proof that you can share with other people. Keep in mind, people want to help you. Even if you have a couple clients, ask them for testimonials. Ask them to write you a couple of lines. Ask them to go to your Google My Business and leave you a testimonial there. That's going to be great for search engine op optimization. But in addition to that, you can now go snap a screenshot of that testimonial and share it on all your other platforms to make what we call evergreen content. Content that you can reuse over and over again that never gets old, that you can repurpose as many times as you want to. You got to do it. And my favorite thing we talk about in the marketing mastermind is doubling down on content. When Glenn and I do, you've seen us. We're going to do this episode. When this episode's done, Glenn's going to rip the one recording. Glenn's going to rip the audio out and use it for the MP3 for the podcast. We're going to take the video. We're going to chop it up and use it for social media bits. Even now, Glenn and I just talked about last week changing the format of the infographics you see. So we have Minds on Muscle content and Fitness Pro Mentor content and Brandon content and Glenn content. So this one hour of interaction turns into a bunch of evergreen content. And for whatever reason, if we miss a few weeks of Minds on Muscle and we can't post something, we can take some of these shorts and we can continue the conversation. Social proof and all of these things, take a photo of it, repurpose it. If you use that over and over again, strategically without over, without diluting it, you can get some amazing results. I love the idea of doubling down. Think about that for a second. Brandon and I record for 40 minutes. If we can pull, and, and we can do this, if we can pull easily, 20 one minute segments out of that, of each of us saying something, that's content that we can use for the next month without even necessarily needing to create any more content. We love creating content for people like you, so we're gonna keep creating new content, but it is that simple. You just have to start thinking outside the box about how you're gonna use that content. And that's the reason why we keep investing to make our hardware interface and our software easier and better for us because it makes it, even though this is a bit of an expensive setup that we're super excited about, super cool, it makes our process and our quality better, and it's what I call future-proofing, to make sure that no matter what, whatever you create today, you can use again in the future. Glenn, where are we going now? We're gonna talk about another important one, and I think a step that a lot of people skip because they're so excited just to get more clients in the door, and that is nurturing. You have to nurture your clients. Most people aren't gonna be ready to buy right away. Sometimes you're gonna get these warm leads, these referrals, where these people have problems and they're ready to put the cash down now and they want you to solve them, and those feel like home runs. You still have to do, do, still have to do due diligence and take them through your process of sales and consulting and, and all that kind of stuff, making sure you're a good fit and assessing and all that jazz, don't get me wrong, but those leads tend to turn over into clients very, very quickly. Most people aren't going to be that quick to sign up with you. They might take days, weeks, months of nurturing before they say, hey, I'm ready to go and work with you. A good friend of mine who has a million dollar online company, which is really, really cool and he's really, really open about it, talks about that for his hit people entering into his communication, revenue building, community building streams, it takes eight to nine weeks for people to join that community see the quality of the content, right? Be a class A lurker, as he talks about, where they don't interact, but they watch everything. And then they make a connection with someone in the group to actually go to a sales call. So if you think about that, 
right? Most people who send you an email or a text message, hey, I heard you're great, how much do you cost, right? That's the thing that we all get. What we gotta do is if you've got people who are on the fence of what they're gonna do or they're worried about the money or they wanna make sure that you're as good as you say they are, this is why we need to build the community because we can bring people into our world and we can consistently deliver high quality product and information so people can see, they don't need to, you don't need to tell them how good you are. You can demonstrate it through the social proof, through your, so, through your content, and through the nurturing. And so this is the reason why nurturing is not exclusive to your clients, although it's important with your clients. It's also around prospects and people that you've never heard and people who reach out to you, suspects and prospects. We have to nurture these relationships. It goes a really long way. It's crazy. And I think this is what's going to stop a lot of people who are listening to this from pursuing this in the long term is that... Some of these people are going to sign up with you after weeks and weeks or after a couple months and you would have had no idea that they were even interested because they sit in your group. You might have messaged them uh, on social media. They might not have replied and you're thinking to yourself, lost cause, this person not interested, da 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 Honestly, for the most part, people just want to sit back and consume until they're ready to pull the trigger. People are now in a world where they get cold emails every day. I get cold emails from people every day about, I got one the other day. I swear to God, this is one that happened. Somebody emailed me and said, hey, would you like your logo on a carpet? We do logos on carpets for you. And I, I, that's not for me. I'm not going to do that. I have no interest in that. People are so used to getting bombarded by information all the time that they're a little bit more hesitant to message you right away because they don't want you to pounce on them and they feel like they are uh, a meat and you're an animal. They're just trying to devour them and get you in their schedule, right? That's not what we want here. A lot of people are just going to lurk in the background until they're ready and that's okay. You're playing the long game. The great thing is, and I have this conversation with my clients as well in another way, is that you're not going to necessarily see results right away. It takes time for the human body to change and get stronger such that you start feeling the quality of life that you have improve, those pains and discomforts start to go away. But once they start going away, because your body's starting to adapt for the long term, they're gonna become more permanent. And it is the same way with the marketing. You to play the long game here. You might work at this for a month or two, like I did, and not really see any leads come through the door, but then all of a sudden, it's like every week or every two weeks, people are starting to respond to you. And that's not because all of a sudden you started doing something right. It's because you were watering that plant for weeks and months and only now did it start to sprout and grow out of the ground. You got to play the long game here. If you can be dedicated to the long game, you can have a ton of clients in your schedule and make as much money as you want to because you're staying with it and you are playing that long game. Another friend of mine that I met when I was in the musical instrument world who's got... Brandon's got a lot of friends. I make them all, I make them all up. When I was in the musical instrument world and I was doing the stuff for Modern Drummer Magazine, there's a guy um, named Mike Johnson who's got this incredible online drum website and I don't know how much money he makes, but he's doing the best as a single online drum instructor for sure. And he's got this great thing that he says is that I don't need to be the most successful instructor, I just need to be the last one standing. And I think that really goes a long way with you is that most of us do this for a few months and we don't get our black belt immediately and we go, ah, I'm gonna switch. And so you gotta really stand and you gotta make this happen because it takes time to earn your belt, so to speak, to get to the level that you wanna be at. It's a long game, everyone. And listen, life is a long game. You can't be playing for tomorrow all the time. People that are always playing for tomorrow, not looking ahead, they don't have anything that's sustainable, they don't have a system, and that's what ends up ultimately having people leave the exercise and personal training a world, this world that they love. And you've got a lot of skills to offer people. Chances are, if you're listening to this, you like thinking about exercise, you're very technical, and now you just need those marketing skills, those systems in place, understand your client avatar, understanding how to nurture. You just need some of these other tools that are an adjunct to your technical in order to help your business grow. So those first four things that we've talked about today are all finding strategies of the FIST formula. They're all about how people find you. And it's one of the reasons why we talk about finding as the majority portion of our program because you need to have people see you and integrate into your world safely. But now we're leading into a couple portions as it relates to the integrating stage because it's very important that even if people don't buy your thing, they need to have a good experience. And so the next point is? Ethics. Ethics. Ethics in sales and the experience that your clients have every time you interact with them, not just in your business professional setting, one-on-one, -on -one, doing the technical work all the time. 
Sales is huge. If you can't sell yourself, you can't sell your product, you're screwed in my opinion. But at the same time, that being said, sales is not a dirty, disgusting, you got to shower after you do it kind of word. There's an amazing sales process that you can do that is all about identifying the client needs. And if you, I love Sandler's seven, sta seven step sales process on top of checking the temperature of the individual and trying to tie down, overcome objections, because if you can identify upfront objections of cost, fear, concern, uh, you're being price shopped with somebody else, you can find those things up front, that's cool. You don't need to push them into a sale. You can have that conversation, identify if it makes sense for the conversation to continue going the way you want it to, and then end it. Because the great thing is if you got a great sales process, is if people don't buy your stuff, but you did a good job ending on a high note, they should know who your avatar is. They should also know you're a good professional person, which means that if Glenn doesn't buy my service, because he can't afford it for whatever reason or something's changed, but he runs into a friend who does need what I do. He goes, hey, you know what? That Brandon guy, I never worked with him, but he works with people just like you. Reputation goes so far. It goes so far. And it's also one of those things where it doesn't take a lot to break it. And it's, if, I mean, and we're in a world now where social media, Facebook, Instagram, your past can come back to haunt you. I mean, you have to really be on your A game with your ethics uh, more now than ever before. And oh, what was I going to say here on this point? I had something I really wanted to drive home, Brandon. Reputation. The Reputation. whole thing here is we want to make sure that we are, you know, all that those original four steps, we're talking to the client avatar and their pain points. When they come in for the sales process, this is where we start talking more about science and really going into the detail of what we do. So if you're someone who's concerned about diluting your scientific message, a good friend of mine who's an uh, instructor, or very educated professional, he's always concerned about not coming through accurately and scientifically. I'm like, I, I get it. But the thing is, is we got to make sure we can connect to the client pain points. And then once they get into our sales world, then we dump them with science, so to speak. Not dump them, but communicate all of our science and our the acumen we've built in our professional accolades. And then from there... If they don't become a client, they know what we know. They know what we're going to do, mostly, and it helps. Well, you have to think science, speak client, right? And I, I've always really appreciated this phrase, and that's people aren't necessarily ever going to remember what you said, but they're going to remember how you made them feel. And if you can deliver an ethical sales experience and you can make people feel like they're smarter for coming to see you because you can talk to them on their level, they're going to think very highly of you. That's the Tom Purvisism. And by the way, if you haven't checked out that episode, he had quite a bit of energy when he spoke to us. Go back and please check out the previous episode because Tom Purvis, wild man, wild man. The one thing uh, I will add on here is that in our industry, especially from uh, especially at big box ships, I've worked at a couple, is their sales, from my experience, maybe things have changed, but not the most ethical, right? They've got this idea and they're like, they're trying to get you to buy 50 100 sessions up front get you into that long-term commitment and that can feel a little bit icky especially if after 10 sessions you're like oh i can't really help this person the way i thought i could uh and now they're locked in and you know they come to see you because they begrudgingly have got all this money they've invested in you but they're not really getting the the thing they want out of it that feels very very icky now here's the great benefit to you is that because so many people in the fitness and exercise industry do do things unethically or they're trying to push large packages on people, you, if you do things ethically and you've got a great reputation, a reputation will seem like a breath of fresh air. And I actually, personally, I mean, I wish everybody did everything ethically, but I understand inherently that I get a benefit from the fact that so many people do things unethically. Because when I do get people that have worked with other personal trainers, and I can't tell you, a lot of people who come see us, because we work with a lot of people over the age of 65, a lot of those people who come see us have been to other professionals before, who said either they can guarantee a return on investment, which no one can, we can't either, no one can guarantee a return on investment. You can get a pretty good idea and be honest with people, but you can't guarantee a return on investment. Or they've worked with those personal trainers and they just didn't treat them very ethically. We seem like a breath of fresh air. And so I really can't say enough. If you can learn how to have a sales experience and run your practice ethically, you are going to have a fantastic reputation, a repu uh, reputation, reputation in this business. And it's, you know, it's funny because in our town, there are a lot of competitors, a lot of personal training competitors and on the same side of town because the real estate in this area is expensive except for the section that we're in is perfect for a gym. So there's a high density of personal training studios within a five kilometer radius. 
But when people ask me if I'm ever worried about competition for our business, I'm really not. And it's, you know, it's kind of what Glenn's saying is that, and I don't want to say that people are doing such a bad job. It's just that most trainers get so excited about going the wrong direction, right? When someone says, you know, they take the sound bite from RTS, they we're rethinking exercise. Then they spend $2,000 on a new bench press bench, right? System. It's like, okay, great. How is that serving your clients? Is that a real, is that an investment that you're going to get a good ROI with? Or can you spend $500 on a dynamometer that's actually going to give you some quantitative data or qualitative data that's going to give you more information? Or is it going to allow you to create content to get more messaging to people faster? And so if you do a good job, you're going to do a good job and people will recognize that and they'll tell more people. But now taking the next step, if we do all this great work, what we got to do is we got to make sure that we're making all of our personal training sessions based off of data. So we're going to talk about very quickly data driven assessments. I cannot tell you enough that I think this is a huge area that a lot of people misunderstand. And I say that because I think a lot of people, because they've either read scientific papers or because they've been told that they're thinking about something a certain way, that they think what they're doing is very scientific and very data driven. And from my experience, most exercise professionals don't have a very scientific, a very data driven process. They might call what they do science and data driven because the information comes from research papers. But when we talk about having a science data driven process, and having our assessments data and science driven, we're talking about being able to collect so much information about our clients. And this starts with us from the consult. We wanna to get to know their preferences. We wanna to get to know what's driving them emotionally. And then from there, what we'll do is we'll start doing our technical assessment on them, right? And we collect all sorts of information on posture, range of motion. We do a qualitative manual assessment of motor control, which it's, it's a kind of muscle test. We won't belabor all the points right now, but we collect all this information and we collate it and we put it on a chart so that we can show clients, hey, here's how your body's actually functioning right now. Here's how we think we can actually help you. And then we'll do a little bit of education. And like we mentioned before, education that they can understand so that they become more invested in the process for themselves, but so they understand how we're gonna work with them. And the great thing is, is that if you collect data and you know how to use it, you can come back to that information and data five, 10, 20, 30, 50 sessions later and show people how they've improved. And if the information you're collecting, you can't show people how they've been improving, then you're probably not collecting the right information. And even if you're not going the right direction, you have data to go, hey, listen, what we've been doing so far hasn't been against where we want. Let's change gears. And that's the real sign of a true ethical professional, in my opinion, is that you're not going to hit home runs and get the first base, second base, third base, every single periodization you do with a client. But you do need those pillar set up so you can have a conversation. You can see, did I do something as a professional that didn't help us get there? Did the client? Because in most cases, and not all, but in most cases, the client does something that actually hinders the progress. They're playing too much sports, they're eating too much, but if you've got this data-driven practice, instead of you going, hey, you know what, you're eating too much rice, I can tell, because you're still paunchy, right? You can't do that, but if you go, hey, you know what, 12 weeks ago we talked about integrating this new food regime and changing your training, and as a byproduct, we were hoping that we would see somewhere between 10 and 12 pounds weight down, one pound per week, and at this point, we've actually saw the weight go up too. Has there anything been going on with your food? You can actually have a conversation about it. And then all of a sudden, as a professional and a consultant, you can advise them to make some changes. It doesn't become an argument because it's based off of data. And so data helps to create this long-term relationship with clients that is really, really powerful. Yeah, you have to learn how to communicate that data. Having that data information is just as important as your ability to communicate that information. So last two things you need if you want to open a personal training studio. And I think this point, I'll let Glenn jump into this first. Uh, it's because it's, you got to do it. Get so busy alone first. Brandon, what do we mean by that? You got to be busy. You got to be you gotta busy. busy. Because I know a lot of folks who don't have clients and they go, okay, I don't have clients, but if I open a studio, if I build that they will come, right? It doesn't work, right? It's so easy to go, ah, I've made this new thing. People are going to enjoy it, right? No. And that's, I mean, maybe they will. And in some cases they do. But what you have to do first as a personal trainer, in my opinion, is you need to get so full that you're so busy that hiring someone and having a location that helps to build more value becomes a logical step. But if you haven't outgrown your own personal practice now, you got to get really, really busy. Now, if you're someone that was like me at one point, and I know Glenn's been like this and Taylor and everyone that's here, and you want to work, how many hours a week do you want to work with clients? 
How, 25 to 30? 25 to 30, right? So you got to, you want to work, let's say 30. You want to work 30 hours with clients. And right now you're like, I want to open a personal training studio. I want 30 hours, but I only got five. And you got these extra 25 hours. And you're like, well, I don't have any clients right now. I'm going to go play video games. I'm going to go make a sandwich. I'm going go to go learn how to cook butter chicken, whatever it is. What you should be doing is devoting those 25 hours, honestly, to all the previous behaviors we talked about. Marketing, building a community, reaching out to people. Because if you spend 25 hours of unpaid time towards paid time activity, you can find the behaviors. They're going to help turn into clients. And if you take that as seriously as you would any other job, those 25 hours will slowly start to diminish because you've done all the outreaching and implemented all the strategies you need to build your fist formula and your customized business. So you got to get busy first. There is no wishful thinking in this industry. Everyone who is successful and has lots of clients has put in the time and the effort to be able to talk to people, learn how to communicate better, to know their client avatar, to work on their referral system, to essentially work on all the other stuff that we've talked about already and all the things that we talk about in the Fitness Pro Mentors program. You have to put the time and effort in there. You can't just expect people to walk through the door and want to buy your service. This is an extremely competitive industry. The bar for entry to become a personal trainer is very low. It is a weekend course and you write the test and you can get insurance the next day. It's actually crazy. It's not like becoming a lawyer where you've got to have, where you have to have an undergrad degree and then you go to law school and then you have to be mentored for a year before you can write your final exam and pass the bar. It's not like that. There's a lot of competition and if you want to supersede the other competition, you have to put the time and effort in there to build your own business. And once your business has grown, there's a better chance that you've started seeing what works what doesn't work, you've probably got your own system, and then bringing people on and being able to replicate your system and teach that to other people is what's gonna have them get busy, right? Uh, I watched a movie this weekend, really great, called The Upside, Brian Cranston, Kevin Hart. Brian Cranston is a guy, can't move, he's a quadriplegic, he can't you know, move from his neck down, he can only use his head and his face, but he's a business guru, taught and opened a lot of different businesses, has got a lot of money, and he keeps telling Kevin Hart in the movie, find your niche and then find a way to scale. And in the world of exercise and fitness and opening your own studio, you have to be able to get busy first, right? Find your niche, get busy first with that system, learn how to scale, bring other people on and teach them your system. That's how we do things here at Strata, and I think it's worked out pretty well so far. And he also makes meth. He... And that's a totally, <laughs> totally different series, totally different series. And it didn't end so well for him in that case. And you'll notice he didn't do, he didn't do business very ethically in that TV show and look where it got him. So he's not dead. He's coming back. Okay. So the final point, the final thing that I want to share with you guys is one that we have not talked about uh, too often on any of the social media streams. And it's one of my personal favorites is that the idea, one of the things that I've done within Strata that I believe is very, very powerful. And it's that... And there's a couple things. If you think of you're a personal trainer and you're at a studio and you want to move on, if you think of the reason why, the reasons why you want to leave that space, right? Usually it's the, there's a couple of reasons, right? The gym doesn't have what you want to work with your clients. Okay. You're not getting paid enough. Makes perfect sense. A lot of gyms don't pay their trainers enough, which we try to fix up here as best we can. We talk about that for trainers that go through this part. Um, and then the other part of this whole thing, really, and the point's escaping my brain for a split second, boom, boom, ah, the once trainers grow to a specific point education wise they're on par with the leader of the facility and they go well i know everything that they know i should now be at a position where i can open my own spot and now what i'm not telling you to do is to become the smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter person but in reality don't be the educational leader don't be the hierarchical pushy boss, try to create a community and try to lead that community in a specific direction. And this is where I love the study groups and trying to, we haven't been able to through COVID, doing community events where you bring all your trainers together. You have to try to create some beacon of connection where every trainer in your facility is who wants to be, is on board with that. And so for the last 12 years, since I started taking the RTS Mastery Program, I've been hosting weekly study groups. And maybe it's one of the reasons why I've become an okay teacher, but trainers who wanna join, like Chris that works here, he's come to them for the last 12 years. And so he's been here and been around this and we create an incredible sense of community. And so most gyms don't have consistent weekly study groups or educational groups or conversation groups where we can all powwow on what's working and what's not working. So we talked about community for clients, but try to build an awesome community for your trainers. 
you'll go fast by yourself, but you'll go farther with your community and with your team. And at Strata, I can say we've got a great family here. Everybody's looking forward to being back together once the COVID protocols and lockdowns are lifted. I, I can't say strongly enough. You, you really want to find a gym where you can feel like you're a part of a community. I've been through you know many different facilities. I'm probably, you know, and I, I don't know if there's something to be proud of or not. I think I've been through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This might be my ninth place. That has Brandon. I hope Brandon is not being worried now. But it, it took me a while to find the tribe and the community that I wanted to grow with. And I'll tell you that you might have all the clients that you need in making good money. But if you don't look forward to going to the gym that you're at every day, that's a problem. That you're only going to last so long. That's a problem. You really have to look forward to the place you're at and working with like minded individuals because everyone's going to grow. Everyone's going to grow that way. So listen, to put a pin in this today, I mean, there's a lot to opening a personal training studio, but in my opinion, if you don't have these previous eight things we talked about dialed in and you're at least working on them, I would say don't think about opening a studio yet. Make sure you know all of these and you've got these systems, simple systems in place so you can open your business. It takes a lot of work and takes a lot of energy. But listen, if you really want to warp speed your progress, please, if you haven't already, join our Fitness Pro Mentors Facebook group. There's a lot of free information with interviews with superstars all over. Glenn, myself, and Taylor do free trainings in there weekly to really try and level things up, including live Minds on Muscle podcasts most of the time when we can. It's really great. But if you really want to talk about warp speeding your progress, contact myself. Glenn or Taylor, and we'd love to set up an opportunity to chat with you about what you can do. We'll give you a step-by-step fist formula that you can go through, and if you're really interested, we can talk about our program and see how we can get you wanting, you want to get there faster. Uh, that's great advice. I got nothing else to add to that, except we have one other thing we have to talk about. Brandon, I want to know, the people want to know, what is your pick of the week? My pick of the week is actually going to be Rode Audio. Now, one of the things that we're not hooked up yet, but the company Rode that makes these pod mics that we're on right now, they make the PSA one arm that we got. Um, they also, an audio interface that we're gonna be using in the future, not the one that's coming next, but we're gonna use it in the future. If you're someone who really wants to double down on high quality audio, because if you're gonna make content, video and audio, you gotta invest into both of them because video is key and then audio is key, wrong direction with the pointing there. It goes a big, big, long way. And so Rode makes it really, really easy to seamlessly connect all these systems. And if you wanna spend a couple, $100 on a mic similar to this Blue Yeti, that's the stand on your desk, USB mic, or you wanna spend a little bit more and get a full audio setup for a podcast, for live streaming, whatever it is, I'm gonna pick Rode. You go check out their website. You can spend as much or as little as you want to get hide to entry level gear. They've been creating pro level audio gear for the music scene and audio scene for decades. So you would definitely not go wrong if you're looking to upgrade your audio setup to anything Rode. Well. What's your pick of the week, man? <laughs> What's your pick of the week? <laughs> Brandon always comes with these like hot tech picks and, and local businesses. I always come with these movies and video games and stuff. My pick of the week is actually the movie Upside and the movie Untouchable. So both of them are based on the same story of a, a French man who is a quadriplegic and he's a very stubborn guy. And he uh, green lights having a former convict who's on parole, just actually just trying to get a signature from uh, the people who are interviewing him for this job of caregiver so that he can go about and just show his parole officer, hey, I made, uh, I made it to this interview and look, I'm doing the work, but he really has no interest in actually uh, helping this guy anyways. It's exactly what you might think. It's a it's a it's a lighthearted comedy slash drama where these two gentlemen learn from each other. One guy, very able bodied, but down on his luck, former convict, another one, is should be successful in business, but not able bodied at all. And it's a great true story about how these two gentlemen come together and help each other grow. For me, it touched me, especially because, you know, this week, if I'm being honest, I felt the frustrations a little bit more of lockdown than I normally had. We, as Brandon said, are going on 14 months of intermittent lockdown. You know, we've been able to work with our clients for about a max a month at a time, maybe six weeks if we're lucky. And that does make it challenging to run a personal training business when you're constantly opening and closing, opening and closing. It makes it hard to convert those potential uh, prospects that you had to new clients. And so 
I was looking for a movie to give me some perspective and I wasn't disappointed. I really highly recommend these movies. Even if you're not too much into dramedy, don't worry about it. You're really going to enjoy these movies. They're a great feel-good pick-me-up. I can't say enough how great the acting is in these movies and how touching the story is. I really suggest if you want it in anglais or English, uh, watch The Upside. If you want to see a great movie in French, you don't mind subtitles, check out The Untouchables. I lived off of subtitles in China for six months, so I'll have to get back to that. So, <laughs> everyone, thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Minds on Muscle podcast. Glenn and I really enjoy this, and we've got some really exciting stuff planned in the very near future with interviews and what we're going to do as soon as we can op- open up to get more people involved with this. If you like this episode, please share it with your friends and family. Tell people about the Fitness Pro Mentors group. Glenn and I want to help as many people succeed so you can help as many people move and exercise pain-free. You go faster by yourself, but we go farther together. Everybody, have a wonderful day. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Let's make it rain.